Hi, everybody. There we go. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. V with Infectious Disease. Hi, Dr. Horn with Infectious Disease. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is our, uh, we do webinars with uh, topics that are requested. So this is a topic that I think it's a great topic. Yeah. It's one that was requested. It's uh, about new antibiotics, new antimicrobials and their spectrum of coverage. And this is, uh, I think this is really important with all the resistance that, that we're starting to see. Yeah. And with all the new antibiotics that are coming out. Yes. And even for us, it's kind of hard to keep track of all the new antibiotics and yeah. spectrum. So we thought it would be really good to talk about it today. Initially, we were going to cover all the antimicrobials, but we decided just to focus on gram negatives today. And hopefully next uh, webinar, we could do gram positive and some antifungals because it was a lot of material. So we were just going to cover gram negatives today. Yes, and there's a lot of information in here. And so, um, you know, even if you're seeing this for the first time, there's so much information that, you know, I think hearing it multiple times is good. And just just getting familiar with yeah. some of the, the names of the new drugs or just hearing it for the first time, I think is sometimes is enough. And we have some tables in here with different color coding. It means the same information in multiple different ways. So at the end, that might be helpful as well. Yes, and we'll send it out as a, a PDF that you can use as reference. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the references, and we show it multiple different ways because some, some ways when you see it, it just clicks and sometimes it doesn't. I think that's good to see it in different. Uh, and if you have any questions at all, please feel free to uh, type in the chat box, and we want to make sure we get all of your questions answered. So if, if anything comes up while we're you know presenting, please just type it in, and then uh, we'll address it as we go. I think that would be great. Let's see. I'm gonna go to the start. All right, great. So this is just kind of to show that, you know, so in the center you have MDR uh, o infections. This is multi-drug resistant organisms. So generally, if you have a susceptibility report, there are a lot of R's there. Yes. there are a, lot of, a lot of R's for resistance. So if they're uh, resistant to multiple different classes of antibiotics, you would say it's a multi-drug resistant organism. And usually, for me, as also hospital epidemiology work, if a gram-negative bug or any bug is more than resistant to three different classes, you consider them multi-drug resistant. But the type of bacteria we're going to be talking about, they're resistant to more than three classes, a lot of um, different classes. And, um, you know, we're just going to circle around and see when you have multi-drug resistant organism, all the outcomes and poor outcomes for us. Patients. One of the big things that I always worried about is increased mortality, as high as 50% or even more. Yes, and, uh, it's for multiple reasons, and sometimes a lot of these things here are linked. So um, they have prolonged hospitalization, and sometimes that comes from being on, really, the link is the earlier the patients are on an antibiotic that's effective, the better, the better they do, the better the prognosis, the shorter hospitalization. And so with these, you know, it, it could be a couple days in before you realize they have a multi-drug resistant organism and they get on the right therapy. And so getting them on the right therapy as quickly as possible. Um, and even uh, when they're on the right therapy with these organisms, the mortality is still high. It's very high, yes. And also here we're going to talk about reliance on combination therapy. So this is uh, you know, the first couple slides here, we're going to talk about combination therapy has been what we've done um, and what's recommended for these organisms because you don't have any options, really. I remember, like, when I started doing my um, fellowship, like, that was back uh, in 2011, we didn't have some of these new uh, gram-negative therapies. So when we had really resistant organism, all we had was combination therapy, which we will talk about tocolistin, tigacycline. Um, so. Right, and so if you get a susceptibility report, so you take a culture like a blood culture or um, perhaps a wound culture, if they have a wound, um, and you take a culture, it goes to the micro lab, they'll test which antibiotics work, and then uh, it may say resistant to everything tested. And so in those cases, uh, that's especially where these 
combination therapies come in because I, yeah. you don't really have very many options. You just essentially give them multiple antibiotics. I remember yeah. having um, patients who had gram negative infection and you don't have the susceptibility for the newer drugs, you know, colistin or tegacycline and everything is resistant. So you're like giving them carbapenem with tegacycline, colistin, even adding three drugs for their um, pressors and the ICU and not doing well. Um, and not having the right antibiotics. So we are in a better place now. Yeah, and that, so this, this slide is essentially showing predict, uh, predictors of mortality, and this is showing combination therapy uh, versus monotherapy, and the monotherapy patients uh, do worse than combinations. So uh, when you don't have any options, and really the drugs we're gonna talk about are hopefully gonna give us more options than just putting them on a combination, even if it says resistant and hoping it works. And this study was back in 2012 when we didn't have the new drugs. So here's another one, combination therapy lowering mortality in KPC bacteremia. And this is a good one because it shows the antibiotics that were used. So combination versus monotherapy and combination therapy, and they show all the different antibiotics. So carbapenem plus tigacycline or aminoglycosate or colistin versus monotherapy with just one uh, antibiotic. And it's interesting to look at the mortality. Monotherapy resulted in 44% mortality. And if you had combination, you were between 20 to 30%. So that's extremely high. Um, and I would say sometimes it's even higher than 44%. So when we didn't have options, and um, so really, really high mortality in our patients. Right. So uh, generally, I'd recommend calling, you know, if I have someone with APC, I'd be calling uh, and getting second opinions and what yeah. should I be doing and making sure I'm treating as aggressively as possible because the outcomes are so bad. And, you know, but these new antibiotics hopefully will give us more options. So we're going to move forward and we have the effect of appropriate combination therapy on mortality. And this is again showing kind of the same thing. It's showing that, you know, when they're on multiple antibiotics, um, you know, it's, it's better for these. Yeah, and this study was also done a while back where they, when you had CRE organism, carbapenem producing enterobacteria species, um, if you are really sick and you had really bad scores, like Apache scores in the ICU, um, even um, combination therapy back then had a little bit better outcome versus monotherapy. So it's a different study showing the same study like before. And these new antibiotics should give us more options. And so if it's resistant now to all, everything that's been tested in, in your lab, then generally we're sending it out for additional testing for these new antibiotics to see if the new antibiotics will work. Yeah. yeah. So here's the priority list for new antibiotics. And this is the most recent uh, that's come out from 2019. Uh, and this is looking at what are the urgent threats as far as resistance, uh, resistant organisms and, uh, and uh, bacteria. And so really a lot of them are gram negatives. And so that's why we wanted to cover gram negatives today. So the urgent threats, and when they classify, they classify these, they say, uh, how is, what is our ability to treat them? And then what is the likelihood that they may spread patient to patient and infect yeah. multiple patients and have an outbreak? And I think, um, you know, we didn't have time to update it because because of COVID, um, you know, last year. But um, this is a very serious threat. And especially with COVID last year, we're seeing so many hospital acquired infections going up, um, especially central line associated infection, UTIs related to Foley catheter. And there's also noticing a lot of gram negative organisms, bad gram negative organisms. Um, spreading in hospital settings and also having resistance. I think, um, you know, one reason might be that we have been using a lot of antibiotics during COVID-19 because patients have been so sick and now we are seeing lots of resistance due to that. Yeah, and, and that's what I was going to say that too, that the antibiotic use yeah. uh, has really gone up yeah. and with all the antibiotic use, you know, the, the more um, exposure patients get with antibiotics and third line antibiotics, the more likely we're gonna have more and more resistance. Yeah. So um, let's see, moving forward, we have recent FDA approved antibiotics. And so these, there are a lot of antibiotics that have come out recently. And I would say more, more so than have come out in a long time. 
Yeah, <laughs> which is really exciting. Yeah. Yes, that, I think that's great. <laughs> yes. I think we need a lot of options and we need to even look and see what antibiotics were used in the past and use them in new ways, yes. uh, which is being done also. And so the ones in red are the gram negative. Um, the ones in red we're gonna talk about today, and those are the ones that cover gram negatives and have gram negative activities. And the gram positive coverage we can talk about in a, a future. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So here are the ones we're going to cover. So before we get into gram negative coverage for these drugs, um, we kind of need to figure out what is the mechanism of resistance. And I really like this graph, this uh, flow chart right here, just showing when gram negatives become resistant, what kind of like enzymes do they produce that makes the resistance? And so beta lactamase producing um, organisms, they divide it by serine versus metallo. For me, whenever I see metallo protease producing scares me because that's, that's the bad yes. one. You know, these um, bacteria are so smart that they have zinc and all these different metallic components and make it more resistant. And, um, and you, have, you see a lot more of them in internationally, but more and more we're seeing this in US as well. So this kind of gives you the class of how they divide it by CDC. So if you see amber, and it's called amber classification, and amber classification for A is penicillinase producing. And for the most part, um, you know, MC, when um, you have, uh, I'm sorry, yes. um, and for KPC under that. For B is where you're worried about NDMs, the bad um, infections with metallo beta lactamase. Um, and then MC is C, and then D is oxacillinase producing, like Acinobacter pseudomonas. So we'll get into it more. How do we cover these bad enzymes with what kind of new drugs? So the first one we're going to talk about is uh, cefalosine tazobactam or Zerbaxa. And um, I'm sure you guys all heard about this drug. Um, uh, unfortunately, and there was some contamination, I, I believe, when they were manufacturing this um, medication. So recently, there have been a recall, and um, they expect we were not going to have Zerbaxa for another year which is really, really sad because we use this, a, we have been using this a lot um, uh, for certain resistance, we'll talk into why, but um, this is a great drug. We just don't have it um, being manufactured because of some sort of contamination. This is a third generation cephalosporin and then a beta-lactam inhibitor, and it's active against gram negatives, and here's some of the gram negatives, and there's no activity against gram positives. So what we usually use Zabraxa is for resistant pseudomonas. It works really well for um, the resistant pseudomonas. Um, you can use it for E. coli, a clepneumol, ESBL, but place for this is when you have resistant pseudomonas. So it was go-to for us, but unfortunately now we don't have this at this time. And here's showing what it was. Uh, no, it shows here the AMP C organisms and you know some of its use. And then the indication. So this is complicated intra-abdominal infection. So essentially a severe abdominal infection. Um, and complicated, I think, means that it's outside of the viscous or it's, um, you know, I just think of severe when I think complicated yeah. mainly, but abscess, abscess or, yeah. uh, you know. I don't think of it as like just a gallbladder infection. I think of yeah. it like perf gallbladder, yes. necrotic gallbladder, you have abscess. But the thing to remember is if you're going to use this for complicated, abdominal infection, the key is it doesn't have anaerobic coverage, so we have to add metronidazole. Right, so this would fit in with a, a two-drug combination for severe abdominal infections. Um, and then here's the, the dosing, and then here are these uh, isolates here. And so if you have one of these and they have a lot of resistance um, and you're running out of options, then you'd ask the lab, test for Zervaxa, and you'd send it out for Zervaxa testing. And then uh, generally, I would order um, the drug or, or have a drug, you know, right now Zervax is not available, but yeah. I, would, I would try to get it, uh, depending how long it takes for the drug to get to your hospital. So most, um, if you have used it in the past, a lot of labs have a disc to check for Zervaxa, um, e-test. 
So you could do the testing for if it's susceptible. Um, but again, go-to for Zabraxa is resistant Pseudomonas, and it also can be used in um, um, UTIs, pyelonephritis, mm -hmm. all hospital-acquired um, infections. So here are some of the slides just essentially showing how it got approval, what they were comparing it with. So this is uh, the complicated intra-abdominal infections. So they uh, did Zabraxa plus uh, metronidazole, and they were comparing it to mirapenem. And so that's essentially how it got approved. Now, I think we should have a slide in the front in the beginning saying, you know, uh, I don't have any conflict of interest. Oh, I, yes. <laughs> you know, because we're using the uh, the names and everything. Um, but names, yes. Yeah. Um, but no, we don't have yeah, I don't, I don't have stock in, in uh, Zervax or anything. I don't mind it, but yeah, I don't like I, it. I, if you'd like to give them a try, I would be more than happy. But they compared, um, Something like meropenem, which has ESL activity and really good cell negative activity, then Zabroxa to see with metronidazole, how does it work in your belly with complicated infection? And it, it was non inferior, it did really well. So then it got approved. Um, but the niche for it is again ESL pseudomonas. Right. And I, I think we included these, these slides just because. You know, I, I like to know what it was compared against yes. when you're when you're going to give it. So, uh, you know, if your options are mere penem uh, versus Zerbaxa, you would you'd know what it was compared against. Then here they compared Zerbaxa to levofloxacin, and um, again, it was uh, found to be superior. But I would it probably didn't have to do this to find out it's superior because right. levo is resistant to so many things. Yes, but yes. It, it came out overall well. So um, one thing I wanna, before we go to the next drug is that Zabraxa, I think if you need to use it, place is for really resistant pseudomonas. And when you have all your multi, um, multiple gram negatives, and you, then you could use this with, for the resistant pseudomonas and you, know, you have infection in your belly, you have E. coli, proteus, and really bad pseudomonas, this can be a one drug that can cover all. And that's still not how I think of it when I see uh, a lot of resistance in a pseudomonas. Mm -hmm. I think of Zerbaxa first. Yes, exactly. That, so. Yes. Now the next one is Cefazidine Abi. Abi Bactam. Abi Bactam. Yeah. Abi Cas is the commercial name. And this is another third generation cephalosporin with a beta lactam inhibitor, afferent gram negatives. And so this is similar to uh, Zerbaxa, no activity against gram positive. So you have gram ne negative activity, but no activity against gram positives or anaerobes. So if you want to cover you know, belly infections, you'd be adding metronidazole as well for the anaerobic problem. The really good thing about, so we just got a question. Would you give um, Zabraxa the, um, as a prolonged infusion? Um, I have not seen any studies, but um, there's always, um, you could give, especially beta lactams prolonged yeah. um, to overcome the MIC. Um, to, um, but I have not particularly seen a study on Zabraxa. But in my mind, I think that's a possibility. Yes, yeah. and that, that's exactly how I feel. Yeah. So I think uh, because it's a time dependent and time above the MIC is important, I think, you know, every time they do uh, with beta lactams also, I, the prolonged infusions, they have better outcomes. It's yeah. best studied in Zosin, Zosin. But, but the more opportunity we have to do that, you know, uh, and when people leave the hospital, if they can go out on a pump where they get it, a continuous infusion uh, that they just load up once a day, I, I always think that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just, you know, the tubing in a hospital and, you know, nursing and the timing and all yeah. that stuff. But for me, um, overall, I think it's a possibility. But for this drug, I am not sure how to right. look into it. I, I'm not sure if the studies have been doing, have been done showing it's uh, more beneficial to give it a prolonged infusion, but I would guess that it would. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't uh, haven't seen it given like that so far. So back to um, Abitas. Um, so whenever I have I need a drug and I'm um, and I have a resistant organism, Abitas is wonderful for ESBL and KTC. Um, but I have something for ESBL, right? I have like Erdapenem, Meropenem. So for me, Abitas is a go-to when I have a KTC produced. Um, gram negative infection. Yeah, and the indications here, you can see it's complicated intra abdominal infections, urinary tract infections, and 
these pneumonia. pneumonias. Yeah, so it's essentially, and I think of this as similar to Zerbaxa, but they each have the kind of yes. replace, right? So Zerbaxa for Pseudomonas and Avicast, again, intra-abdominal, you have to add metronidazole. Um, and Avicas is when you have um, KTC producing um, gram negative organisms, so carbapenemase. So you have a gra um, gram negative organism that carbapenem is resistant. And now, um, you know, you can't use erdapenem, you can't use meropenem, and now you could use Avicas, and that's where it's places. This is Avicas or septazium avibactium in. in CRE Klebsiella pneumonia bacteremia. And so here's uh, essentially Avicaz here, and then uh, these other ones, and you can see what these are here. This is carbapenem plus aminoglycoside, carbapenem plus colistin, and then other. And you can see the Avicaz did very well. So outcomes for patient when you have a resistant organism like this, um, Avicaz does well. Yeah, so for CRE organisms. Yeah, especially carb. Um, you have to be careful about what kind of CRE. So we'll get into that because if it's a metallic protease, um, you know, oxa and things like that producing, this might not be the best. But um, if it's a KTC, then yes, fatty gas works really well. And how, you might, guys might wonder, how do we know? So that's why we have to, you know, when you get a resistant organism, it's so important to work closely with your lab, microbiology lab to see, do you think it's a KPC? Do you think it's a CRE? What additional tests do we need to do? So when you get gram negative isolates and they're resistant all from top to bottom, then it's really important to like, you know, it's resistant to erdapenem, for example, right? And then you gotta ask your lab, hey, is this a CRE? Is it a KPC? Is it CPCRE? So then they could tell you how bad of a resistant and then you know exactly what you could use towards that. This is colistin versus avicaz in the treatment of infections due to CRE. So this is um, similar. This is similar to the last one, but uh, not exactly the same. 38 patients were treated first with avicaz uh, and 99 with colistin. This is bloodstream and respiratory infections, all-cause mortality at 30 days. And you can see all-cause all mortality was lower in the avicaz group than it was in the colistin. And this physician at 30 days, Avicaz had 64% probability of a better outcome as compared to colistin. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm not a huge fan of colistin, but, you know, yeah. when, when it comes down to your only options that you have, you know, that's when we use it. So, uh, but this is from 2017, and this is somewhat reassuring. I yes. Think. And then the next one is going to be Vabomir, this Mirapenem Vaborbactam. And here's what it looks like. It's a carbapenem and a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So we have never really had a drug in the market that has carbapenem with the inhibitor, beta-lactamase. So this is a very nice, a novel drug. And here's so the indication that inhibits. So this is KPC. And it looks like it's only approved for urinary tract infections. So I've never given Vabomir before. Yeah, I have given it. Um, a handful of times. And the thing to remember about Vabermeer is it's meropenem. So, and again, if you look at the organisms, E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter species, right? Um, but it's key here to look, it's not for resistant pseudomonas. Because if you have a resistant pseudomonas that is resistant to meropenem, it's not going to have any more activity against meropenem with the inhibitor. So that's really important because sometimes people mistake it. We could use this for resistant pseudomonas and it, ha it doesn't have a place. For resistant pseudomonas, again, uh, the Braxa. For Vabramir and Abicas are kind of on the similar KPC, like, you know, um, um, KPC covering for a lot of the gram negatives. So again, but Unfortunately, this is a newer drug and they only have currently approval for UTIs. But, you know, of course we use it off label. So patients with a lot of like high level resistance plus allergy, mm -hmm. would you say this is like, yes. it's like a, a third generation cephalosporin allergy or, or, or just yes. allergy to cephalosporins? And then you're That's trying a, to figure out something. Would you, would you say this is? 
that's a really that. good question. So like, you know, you have a KPC organism and you're like, you know, bad E. coli, Klebsiella, and they have bad cephalosporin allergy. And now you're stuck with, do I use Avicat or do I use Labramia, right? In that case, of course, Labramia because they have cephalosporin allergy. Yeah, it, it's, well, I feel like it gets hard. I mean, when they have a lot of resistance, but then they also have allergies. Yes. And sometimes that can be extremely difficult, I think, limiting their options. And that's a, that would actually be another reason um, why we want to get good allergy testing and see if those allergies are real. Yes. Um, because then you're kind of... Uh, and I think that ties back to Dr. Allen's uh, lecture yes. last month. Right, exactly. Yeah, and that's so important because if they're options are getting limited from their allergies and yeah. then they're limited from all the resistance and you have to um, you know I think refer to to his his lecture and yeah. kind of go from there yeah now Babamir versus Avicaz and this is uh, KPC producing Enterobacteraceae um, in global collections of KPC positive Enterobacteraceae Babamir was more potent than Avicaz so again I think uh, similar to what we said if you guys are worried about it KPC producing enterobacteria gram negative bacteria, and you don't um, have a, you have two options. You have Avicaz or Babramir, and some perform better than others in certain gram negatives, but this, these are the two options. And here's comparing all three of them Avicaz or Baxa, Babomir. And so you can see when they were approved, the, a little bit about the uh, information about them, FDA indications are here as well. Pseudomonas activity, yes, yes, and yes. And then carbamase act, carb, uh, carbapenemase activity. Uh, so is there Baxa? Is there no? So you cannot use a Baxa for if you have a KPC organism. So that's what they mean there. Um, so you can use Avicaz or Vibramir, but not the Baxa. And then MRSA coverage, they're all no. So you need to add another antibiotic if you want to cover gram positives. And then here's the dose and frequency duration and then the renal dosing. But I think this is good. It, it's good to look at, you know, compare them uh, each together like that. And then the next one, uh, lazomycin. And this is another one. So I haven't given this before. This is a new aminoglycoside. And, here, these are for all you biochemists out there that like comparing them. Okay. This is amicacin here and then plasmomycin here, and you can see how similar they are. So I have given all three drugs we talked about so far, but I have not given this drug. Um, I have not given a new aminoglycoside. So it's new for me as well. And they have the same aminoglycoside warnings as the other. So ototoxicity, nephrotoxicity, uh, neuromuscular blockage, fetal harm. So uh, the same kind of side effects, you know, um, that we all worry about when we give them the glycoside. And so it's an amino glycoside, concentration dependent, so you want high peaks. And then antimicrobial activity, activity against Enterobacter ACA in the presence of class A and D. These are ESPL, KPC, OXA. So it's a really good amino glycoside because it has like mm -hmm. broad activity. So it's like, no, it's, it's better if you, you know, than activity than if you think about like Bebermir or Zabrac, I'm sorry, Avicat, because they have OXA um, and KPC and ES, so much broader. Um, so I guess it has some um, benefit when you need it, uh, but I have not used this yet. And it looks like um, no actinum, um, acinetobacter and pseudomonas is plus or minus. Here's the dosing and monitoring. And so, Indication and usage, uh, complicated urinary tract infections. So this is what it's uh, indicated for, dosage and therapeutic drug monitoring is here. And then moving forward, imipenem, rolabactam, Rick Rick Carbrio. Rick Carbrio. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I have not used the new amino glycoside, but I have had to use Rick Carbrio. Um, so uh, I think of it as like, it, it's so broad, the next two gram negatives, they're so broad coverage. Um, it's good, but I, I'm very sad for our gut flora. <laughs> right, yeah. So imipenem, so uh, this is just imipenem here, and relobactam inhibits 
So ESBL, KPC, AMPC, um, and some OXA. And here's the indication. So uh, intra-abdominal infections, urinary tract infections, pneumonia, and here it has the organisms here. Now, um, I think this is good to know about maybe something in the future. Hopefully, yeah. You know, I, I and some of these I don't want to give. Yeah. Like most, <laughs> most have, of them I don't. I don't want the opportunity to. Give I, these. Have, I have had to give um, recovery on patients who had really pseudomonas and also other gram negatives. Um, and the nice thing about Recarbrial and um, the next drug we will talk about, Sulfaricol, is that they have, they kind of can cover these broad um, gram, gram negative resistance. And, um, you know, we have had some um, burn patients who have really lots of gram negatives and have had really bad resistance that have required long courses of Recarbrial. This is Sulfaricol. And this is Fetroja. So this is actually a, a, a new kind of uh, mechanism of action. It's, a, it's very unique, and I think it's very interesting. Uh, it's a siderophore cephalosporin, so it binds to free iron. And so if you look at this, uh, and that's where it gets its name. So cephidrocol, so Fe, so is iron, and then Troja, like it's a Trojan horse. So here you can see it, here's iron here. It will bind to iron, and then when the cell imports the iron and brings in the iron, the antibiotic comes in with it. So it's actively importing uh, the antibiotic. And so because the cell is trying to bring in iron and it's also bringing in the antibiotic, it's like a Trojan horse is what they're saying. And so, it's really smart. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very smart yeah. way to do it, right? Yeah, so, really smart. Um, you know, the, when they promote it and things, they'll have um, the Romans and they'll yeah. have you know, the tr big Trojan horse or something, but so it brings in the surfiterical and then it, it binds up um, the penicillin binding proteins here. And, you know, but that's where it gets its name, the, the iron and the Trojan horse. And so th this is, and this is unique. And I like it when they come out with unique mechanisms of action and, and we're still coming out with ways um, for new antibiotics to work. And um, so what I have noticed is, um, because Zabraxa is now not available in the market, we have been having so many, seeing a lot of resistant pseudomonas, especially after COVID and now with COVID patients, lots of resistant pseudomonas. So I'm kind of forced to, when that much resistant, I don't have any other options. I'm kind of, I'm testing them for fetrocephericol or recarbrial, and then using one of them for pseudomonal infection because I don't have anything else left because the Braxa is out of the market. So it kind of sucks, and I'm sure it's not just us. A lot of you are in the same place too. So these are some of your options, but they're extremely expensive. Um, so. And here's some more information about it. So it's it's kind of, we're taking some of the side chains of uh, ceftazidime and cefepime, but here they're taking this part of septazidine, this part of septime, and then there's this uh, area that binds to free iron. So uh, that's kind of how it's formed. I think all this stuff is so amazing when they come mm -hmm. up with how to how to uh, create new antibiotics. But so anti-gram negative activity of new antibiotics. So here, this is a good summary, and you know this is something uh, that's good to keep and kind of look back on, you know, to compare the different antibiotics. And so we hear. We have Zerbaxa is first, and all of these have ESBL activity. And then does it have CRE activity? Does it have uh, MDR pseudomonas and then acinetobacter? So uh, an acinetobacter is, is classified as uh, one, of the one of the bad bad ones, right? Yeah, yeah. one of the terrible. But I think um, uh, there are some new other drugs that can uh, maybe have some activity against the Cenobacter, but doesn't get into here right now. And here's another way of looking at it. I think, you know, all the different ways of looking at it, I think, are, are good. Um, so here's another way, you know, the organism and then the antibiotic, does the antibiotic have coverage against that? And here's another, here's a summary of the multidrug resistant isolates. Here's the agent, KPC producer, uh, NDM producer, and then these uh, pseudomonas. I like this slide a lot. Um, so, it, you know, green, it covers. 
So Seth does been able back down uh, Avi Cash and have nice cake PC coverage, but it's not really good for like those um, OXA CRE uh, from, you know, especially from, um, we are, CRE is actually um, reportable. So in each state, if you have CPCRE, mm -hmm. the health department tracks and they want to, they make sure that um, there's no transmission because we want to try to prevent. So that's, something is reportable and monitored really closely. So pseudomonas is kind of a yellow light, plus or minus. Um, uh, Sefta, so tazobactam, pseudomonas plus or minus, not a lot of good coverage. Meriparum, virbabactam, KPC, it's great. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes. That's really good question, um, Jeff. Um, KPC is what we see a lot um, in Nebraska and a lot of uh, United States states. Um, we see, like it used to be ESBL, now we have gone ESBL, now we're seeing more and more KPC. And this is where you have your Avicast and you have your um, Vabramir to use. And then, um, you get the CRE with CPCRE with OXA NDM, um, the I, uh, imp uh, mutation enzyme producing, which is really bad. And a lot of them are um, travel related from other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, what you have the uh, cephericol and um, recarbrio. So I, you're right, KPC is the most common um, after ESBL now. And that's reportable to the state. And um, KPC is monitored, um, um, uh, but um, but this, uh, they keep an eye on these things. But the one that the state and CDC and everybody's very hyper vigilant about is CP uh, uh, CRE. So like the OXA, the NDM, the M, um, um, because you don't want that to spread in a hospital and the community. So that's reportable, and let's say if our hospital had that, that you know, it has to be told to the local health department and the state health department, and they'll come on to see, are we doing everything right? Sometimes you have to swab like the other people on the floor if you didn't realize, and the, the patient- the patients nearby. Yeah, so if the patient had a really bad CPCRE and they were not in isolation because we didn't mm -hmm. know, then you have to swap everybody and make sure you didn't give it to the other patients. Mm -hmm. um, usually they ask to do a rectal swab and to uh, make sure, because if you have CPCRE, then um, um, OCRE, you have to keep those patients in isolation forever in your hospital because you don't want to come back and spread to other patients. I think that was our Last slide. What questions do you guys have? I feel like this is a lot of information because a lot of um, different drugs. That's why I kind of try to um, simplify things as after each drug where you could use it. And so, um, which ones you now, as far as um, you know, the different hospitals that people work at or the size of their hospital. What would you recommend as far as which ones people should carry oh yeah and, and which ones because sometimes we'll get questions and they'll say should we have this on formulary yes should we carry this one or that one or which one that's a really good question and just like jeff is telling uh, us um i think we all have esbl coverage we all have you know yeah. meropenem or depenem but then i think we need to make sure we have something for kpc which is the second most common that you're seeing right so either formulary or be able to get it readily available. So either Avicast or Vibramir, uh, whichever one is like cheaper for your hospital, you, you know what I mean? Um, so that might be way to go. Avicast um, might be an option, or for some reason, if you can, Vibramir. Um, a lot of places carry Avicast as their formulary. Another important thing to remember is looking at your resistance for your hospital, right? Are you seeing a lot of KPC? Are you seeing a lot of CREs? If not, maybe just making sure you could get the drug when you do need it. Um, that's kind of how I would think about it. So it sounds like it's 
uh, individualized to each hospital, yes. how much resistance they have, what does their antibiogram show, yeah. if they're able to get an antibiogram, yeah. uh, and making sure that they can test when they need it. I, and I, I think that's important because um, sometimes when we recommend testing, people say, I'm not sure if we can get testing yes. for that. But it's better to see before the patient's there. Yes. Right? But, but yes, I think, um, so it sounds like each hospital has to make that decision individually. Yes. That sounds like a good, good way to go. Can you explain how I know which resistant enzyme my gram negative bug has? Yeah. If all the bugs are listed as resistant. Yeah, yeah. so um, for me, the triggering is when I see like you have a gram negative E. coli, and they list, they put erdapenem as resistant, right? And you're like, huh, why is my E. coli resistant to erdapenem? That yeah. should um, uh, make your um, kind of It'll come on your radar. Radar, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Then you, um, you know, make sure to put them in isolation, and then you ask your microbiology lab, hey, is this a KPC? Is this a CRE? Can you look into it? Um, you know, if it's a KPC, then they, you know, you would do the abicast. Um, if it's a CRE, then you got to figure out what kind of CRE they have to do susceptibility and tell you like what works for. So I think uh, what we all need to be aware is that keeping looking at the gram negative and looking at if they're all resistant and usually and I'm, I don't think a lot of labs are testing for these new drugs. So your trigger will be if they're resistant to many or you know more than three classes or especially if they're resistant to carbapenem. Right, and some labs have an algorithm where they'll yes. say, if it's resistant to this, then we test this. Yes. And so I think, um, you know, having, uh, you know, kind of uh, su suspicion for it, yes. not only, you know, when you see the patient, when you see the susceptibility report, but in the lab when they have it, when it comes out resistant to uh, meropenem, is it being tested? Is it kind of reflexing or is it is it yeah. going down that algorithm where you'd say, this should be, uh, have further testing. My trigger would be if it's resistant to carbapenem, then you're like, well, you know, we need to work this up more. Yeah, and, and uh, there are some patterns um, yes. that you can see where they say, if it's resistant to this, this, and this, then consider this. Yes. And so, you know, um, I think our lab has done a great job of looking at, you know, resistance patterns and uh, really the more eyes that look at it, the more times yeah. it's double checked, I think the better. But, for, uh, but that's a good stewardship. Um, you know, way of uh, reviewing patients and seeing if they're on the right antibiotics. I also yeah. think it's a real, what you mentioned earlier, working with your microbiology lab to alert you when they see those patterns, especially when there's part of kind of resistance. Now, let's say that you find out a couple days later mm -hmm. that it's resistant. Let's say you have the patient on um, maybe a zosin or carbapenem, mm -hmm. and you find out a couple days later that it has all this resistant, but the patient's getting better. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, what would you do in those cases? Yeah, so like let's say somebody had a really bad, it depends on the site of infection for me too, yeah. right? So like if you had a KPC or CRE bacteremia, um, even though the patient is getting better on Zosin, in my mind what that triggers is it's kind of keeping the bacteria at bay. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's not killing the bacteria. It might just like, you know, keep them just at bay and all of a sudden it's going to flare up again. So if it's a bad infection, I better get them on the right antibiotic is how I think about it. So bacteremia versus urinary tract infection. Yeah, and urinary tract infection, then I need to, um, what I do is like, hey, it's just a colonization, right? If they have infection to begin with at all. Um, but um, so I think it's kind of evaluating patient by patient. You know, I remember when they did that large trial where they looked at ESBL, for example, bacteremia, where in the lab it says it's susceptible, but they had to stop the trial halfway through because they realized um, if you have ESBL bacteremia with Zosin versus Marum, Marum was superior. Right, I think that's Merino. Mar Merino So trial. the Merino trial, so if it's in the blood yeah. and it's an ESBL, yes. then carbapenem. Yes. Yeah, and I think that solved that question. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. But in the urine, there's more studies and now you can use other things and they might be okay. Um, so more to come, but I, I usually pay individual patient by patient. If you're really sick, then let me let me get you in the right therapy. Okay, great. So if we have any more questions, if there are any more questions at all, please email us. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, so this is going over gram negatives. We will have uh, a future webinar discussing gram positives and then... A little uh, bit of antifungal and too. And antifungal as well. 
you know, I think, you know, I hope, you know, this uh, made things a little bit more clear. Sometimes it's hard if you see so many new, uh, new, uh, just words and you know, yes. this, just the funny names. But, um, you know, if, if you have any questions, please email us. If you have any suggestions or recommendations for further topics um, in the future, we'd love to cover and get all of your questions answered. Um, and so through MD Stewardship, we uh, are always available for calls. You know, please call us and ask us uh, questions about your patients so we can get them on the right antibiotics as soon as possible. Um, but thank you very much for, for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much.